This video is presented by the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. Rainfall, and where rainfall goes, it becomes more and more important uh, today as uh, population grows, as we start looking at where water goes whenever it rains. And so we have a rainfall simulator here that we'd like to use to illustrate the importance of managing every raindrop whenever it falls. And so we have here a rainfall simulator that I want to use, and with it we have trays that are at the top, and they have about 25 holes in them that we will put water in, about a one inch rainfall event, and we'll put it up there, and it's going to fall on four different scenarios. And then the water is either going to come off the top and run out this top container into what we're going to call runoff water, or it's going to be able to go through the soil profile, or whatever the profile is, and come out the bottom, and we're going to call that groundwater. And so as we start doing this, I want to start putting under different scenarios where rainfall might go. This here is going to represent this land as we go back historically, what this land looked like 100, 200, 300, or 1,000 years ago. And so this, uh, as we start looking at the state of Texas and much, much of the center part of the United States, much of this was in grassland prairie or we get in the east side of Texas where our tall pines were. They were very scattered, large trees, lots of grasses underneath them. And as we start looking, this is going to represent that land. This is primarily Cytoscroma, which is our state grass of Texas, a little blue stem in the back. These are deep-rooted deep bunch grasses that were historically here at one time. This is land the same as this here, but I've taken out these tall grasses and I've replaced them with grasses that will come up real quick after a rain event, then make a mature seed head, and then go dormant or die back. And including that will also be some forbs or wildflowers that would be in there, and then also some other things here. This is going to represent our turf. We have about 30 million acres of turf in the United States, and so this is going to represent that land. This is going to be an impervious area where we start looking at as we're sealing over much of our highways, with our land with highways, uh, with streets, with buildings. Uh, this is the area that's sealed over, and so that's going to represent this land. And so I'm going to put about a one inch rainfall event in each one of these, and we'll start looking at where the rainfall goes. I like to use this to illustrate where rainfall goes simply because we start looking at uh, the water that we depend on, either out of the ground from, from our aquifers to recharge, uh, to also supply for our cities. Also, we get water from our lakes that are also dependent on those springs for that base flow. And so as we start looking at those, there's, there's basically some things that we need to look at. And one of those is the fact that there used to be several thousand springs uh, all maybe up to 10,000 springs in the state of Texas at one time. Most all agree that only about 60% of those springs are still flowing. 40% of the springs have dried up, and the others are not flowing at the same rate they did 150, 200 years ago. And so we start looking at why those springs have dried up. Uh, not only in Texas, but nationwide and worldwide, those springs have dried up. And so we start looking at that, there's basically three reasons those springs don't flow like they did. The first is just the fact that we're here. And when you start looking in the state of Texas, the 14 million people are more now in the state of Texas, and each one uses over 100 gallons of water per person per day. We get into over a billion gallons that's taken out either out of our lakes or out of our aquifers every day. And so as we start looking at that, just the fact that we're here and we're using water for irrigation, we use it for our landscape, we use it for in-home, for industry, we're pulling water out of the ground in much, many cases much faster than it can recharge into our aquifers. And so as we start looking at the second reason, uh, and the other two reasons really has to do with why we don't put water back into the ground as fast as we used to. And the first of those, I'd say, is the absence of fire. The impact that fire had, if we go back historically, uh, back 200 years ago to several thousand years ago, fire was a normal process that the land was, that it would move through the state of Texas from east to west to north to south uh, on a regular basis. Uh, either from lightning strikes or as we started looking at the Native Americans used fire on a regular basis for lots of different reasons. 
And so the land was constantly burned over, and in some cases very frequent, others uh, a very infrequent. But that fire then, there's plants that like fire, and there's plants that do not like fire. And so as we started looking at those that like fire, they were what we call our bunch grasses, those perennial, deep-rooted uh, bunch grasses, much as what we have right here. And those grasses <clears throat> then also have a very deep root system. Uh, and as we start looking historically, they uh, like fire, but simply burn off and suppress other woody plants. They have a massive root system, as I'd like to show you here. Uh, this is one grass that's uh, called green sprinkle top. And we start looking at the root system of it, a very massive fibrous root system that uh, uh, these roots are constantly dying and replacing themselves. They'll live about three years and then they replace themselves. And so they have and they're able to pull out lots of water and lots of energy uh, and stored there and use it whenever fire would burn off the top of it, they would help it to come back with vigor. And so as we started looking at that, that's what the fire did. And it also, there's plants that do not like fire. And many of those are the woody plants, uh, the understory plants, the, the invasive woody plants that come in uh, and then take over and choke out much of our grasses. Since fire has been stopped, for the last 125 years in the state of Texas, we're seeing that those woody plants continue to increase, and so we've got much of our land into a forested type situation. Work at Sonora Experiment Station has indicated that as we increase canopy cover, especially in cedar and those invasive species, less and less water goes back into the ground to recharge those aquifers. So the fact that we stop fire, we change this from a grassland community to a forested area in much of the state of Texas, reducing the water's ability to go back into the ground. Then the third reason has to be the way we manage animals over the last 125, 150 years. Historically, buffalo would migrate through here, graze an area down, and would not come back for seasons, possibly, or even years. And so as, with that, these plants were able to be able to be grazed down and then have lots of time to recover uh, and rebuild not only a root system, but also uh, the tops and the leaf surface and, and the seed heads to go along with it. But as we've come in and built our fences in the last 125, 35 years and put our cattle and sheep in there and allow them to graze whatever we want, these tall grasses that we have here are ones that are easily selected by the livestock. We call them ice cream grasses because they like to eat those grasses so much. And they'll go and eat those grasses down, continually graze those down, prior to going to any other plants. And as they do that, we start looking at these plants as it grazes down. These roots will last about three years, but as this plant is grazed sharp, it knows to survive, it has to have leaves to catch energy from the sun. And in doing that, then it sends all of its energy up to build new leaves and then make a seed head for then sacrificing the roots. And if we continue to graze these down on a constant basis, the roots are dying but not being replaced. And as they get smaller and smaller, we'll see that this plant then fades out uh, when it's being overgrazed. And so this is the third reason why uh, we do not have the water going back into aquifer. And we can illustrate that by looking at these three scenarios. And so if we start looking here, a raindrop first is going to hit this leaf and then gradually go down. And then we have all those stems that that water has to go through. We have all the organic matter from those dead leaves that are there on the soil surface. And so that raindrop hits here, gradually slows down, then it has a chance to go back into the ground. So when we start looking here, how much water do we have is run off? This rainfall event, we didn't have any. But we start looking over here, the water's still dripping underneath here, and all this water was allowed to go back into the soil and then recharge our aquifer. But when we take out these plants, and the first thing we do is see this raindrop, the first thing it's going to hit is going to be bare soil. And as it does that, it hits it with lots of impact, knocking up that soil product particle, and then it starts moving down rapidly because nothing there to slow it down. And so when we start looking at that, how much water did we get back into the ground? In this case, we didn't get any. Every bit of this rainfall came over the top and then went down as runoff. And so we lost every bit of this rainfall event simply because we didn't have anything protecting the soil and so that we could keep that water there in place and get it back into the ground. And then when we start looking at these two, there's a differences in the water color as well. And so as we start looking at these here, this is a lot very clear, uh, which allowed that water to move into the ground without all the contamination. But when we have that water run off, that impact of the raindrop picks up that soil and then carries it along with it. And so we see a loss of sediment that's also being carried in this water. So our water quality goes down at the same time. 
It takes several hundred years.